body of Christ. And he says, you are the salt of the earth. Now, the problem in the world is not the corruption in the world. The problem is the lack of saltiness in the body. And so he is saying, you are the answer in Christ. You are the answer through the Spirit. You are the answer through the work of God in your soul, making you righteous. You are the answer to the corruption of the world. And that tide cannot sweep you unless you have relented and lost the salt, the righteousness that I will pour into you. And so the last word in the scripture is, and the spirit and the bride say, come. The spirit of Christ and the bride of Christ say to the world, whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. Now, the a big question there then is what is the body of Christ? Is it the organized church? Well, let's look for a moment at Scripture. But here is a place where we need to see the whole thrust of Scripture to understand. There's a wonderful story in the way God has dealt with his creation and will deal. In the beginning, Genesis 1 and 2, he created the world, all that's within it, the cosmos, the universe is all of it. And he created us, Adam and Eve, in his own image. And then Adam and Eve decided to orient their lives not around their origin and around God, but around themselves and their own desires. And that reorientation, when they turned their faces away from him and looked to the, to the fruit of the tree and looked to their own desires and said, we'll center our lives in ourselves, they changed centers and when they changed centers, the whole universe went out of kilter. Read Romans 8, the end of Romans 8, and it says that the whole creation is groaning. The very nature is groaning, waiting for the day that the consequences of our sin will be undone and in symbiotic relationship to a redeemed people, the world, the universe, the creation can be redeemed. Nature can be redeemed. Now, you will notice that God started with the whole of his creation. But by the time you get to chapter 6, the thoughts and imaginations of men's hearts are evil and evil only. So he said, I've got to start over again. So he started with Noah and his family. And so after the flood, that's all there was, God and that family. So he started with the whole. But by the time you get to chapter 10... You have the Tower of Babel, and uh, mankind is saying, we'll make a name for ourselves. God has been put to the margin. They've centered themselves in themselves, and God says, I've got to start over. But this time, he doesn't start over with the whole. In his infinite mercy, not wanting to destroy the whole human race, he starts with a part. And now we've moved from the whole to the part. And what is the part? It's Abraham. And he says to him, I'll give you a son. Out of that son will come a people. I'll give you a land. And out of that people will come a Messiah. Out of that people will come the Redeemer. The plan of redemption will come through you. So he starts with a part for the whole. Your people, read, read Isaiah your people are to be a light to lighten all the Gentiles. So he starts with a part to get to the whole. But then by the time you come to the end of, cha of Deuteronomy chapter 30, he finds that the part, those that are circumcised, they have the mark of God in their bodies and in their family. The mark is there that they belong to God but they've got the mark in their bodies, but they don't have it in their heart. And so God has to say to Moses, now I'm going to have to start with the ones that are circumcised not in body, but in heart. So now he's got to go with a part within the part. Because the part that he wants, wanted to use for the redemption of the world, that part is now corrupt. So he starts with the part within the part. Now that's what we know in terms of, we cover with the term the remnant. 
It is the remnant within the people of God that is the hope of the world. And then you come to Isaiah, the 8th chapter, and Ezekiel in the, in the, eight, the eighth century, and you come to Ezekiel in the 7th and 6th century, and God says, now I can't even, I can't even work with the part within the part. Oh, if I could only find one person. Now, you'll notice that the whole thrust of God is the redemption of the world. There is no way that you and I can ever exhaust our master, our comprehend the incredible love that burns in the heart of God for his creation. He does everything he can do to save it. And so he says, if I could find one, I could save it. And so in the counsels of God, the son says, well, I guess the only option is for me to become one. And so he was conceived in the womb of the virgin and became a boy in Nazareth and grew up to be a man, one of us, was tempted in all points like as we are, but instead of living like Adam and Eve in the beginning, he lived the way God wanted him to live and God's will was the delight of his life and he became the hope of the world. And he says, I need help. And so he called 12 men. And he spent three years with those 12 men. They slept together, ate together, talked together, argued together. They lived together. He lived with them and they lived with him. And then you will remember at the end, after he was crucified at Pentecost, by then there were 120. And then there were 3,000 and 120. And then there were 5,000 more and there were 8,000 and 120. But it's an incredible story how God had to move from the whole to the part to the part of the part to one of us. And then now the door is open and he's moving across the world. And we have the privilege of being in that. And that's the hope of the world. But what is it? It is those. Notice Paul understood this and spelled it out. In Romans 2, in Romans 2 you, you will remember this passage. Very significant passage in the book of Romans and in the New Testament. The people of God... The Jews were circumcised. Circumcision is deed of, is, indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. In other words, you can be circumcised and uncircumcised at the same time. You can be circumcised in your body and uncircumcised in your spirit. So if those who are uncircumcised keep the requirements of the law... Will not their uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? In other words, uncircumcision can be circumcision. You see, here is a place where language and titles and names uh, break down for us. Then those who are physically uncircumcised but keep the law will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law. For a person is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is, it, is true circumcision something external and physical. Rather, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and real circumcision is a matter of the heart. It is spiritual and not literal. Such a person receives praise not from others, but from God. Now, who are the ones who receive the praise of God those whose hearts have been touched by him and been redeemed. It's not external relationships. It is an internal soul relationship between a person and God that makes him a part of the hope of the world. And that is what is meant by that term, the Holy Apostolic Catholic Church. You notice the first word, holy. And that's what it is. That's what he works within us. He says, as I am holy, be ye holy. That's why Christ died. You'll notice that again and again in the New Testament, that he might make us holy before him. And apostolic, the ones who stand in the tradition of that 
philosophia perennis, that perennial